I'm thankful, glad that you've joined us by the internet. Appreciate you being with us in one of our most recent services here. Second Peter chapter 2, we've been studying this series, and, and uh, some people don't believe that doctrine is important. Obviously, we know the word doctrine just simply means teaching. And so that means that uh, there are some false doctrine that sometimes people teach, different um, beliefs uh, uh, teach. And uh, the bottom line is doctrine is whatever's taught. So if you have false doctrine, it just means you have false teaching. If you have biblical doctrine, it means you have uh, biblical teaching. And I believe that God's word is important, and I believe that doctrine is important because it's mentioned over 55 times the word doctrine is mentioned. I believe it's essential for us to study this and um, because if a believer is not rooted and built up in Christ, it's easy for a Christian to become prey to Satan's ministers. And so you're in 2 Peter chapter 2. This has kind of also been our theme verse for the entire series, and it comes from Colossians 2.7. It's going to go up on the screens right now. Look at this. Notice it first starts off with rooted and built up in him. Let's say that first part together. Ready to begin? Rooted and rooted and built up in him. Who's the him, church? That's right. It's Christ. It's Jesus Christ. And it says, and established in the faith as ye have been. What's that next word? Talk. Why do we come and listen to preaching and teaching and life groups? And why do students come to student ministries? And why do children come to Awana? It's because we want to teach them something. It's because we want to be taught something. What is that? We want to be taught the Bible. We want to learn the Bible so we can grow in the Bible. So we can be rooted and built up in Jesus. And I am so thankful that the Word of God has given that to us so that we may abound therein with thanksgiving. And, uh, you know, the truth is, uh, uh, Timothy said uh, in 2 Timothy 3.13 that, um, uh, that men shall come and, and that seducers shall come and that they will wax worse and worse and that they will uh, be deceived and, and will be deceiving. And we have learned over this study that seducers means an imposter. There are people, just because they stand behind the pulpit, uh, does not mean that they are speaking on the authority of God's Word. Many are an imposter. Uh, Timothy, uh, through Paul's writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy, uh, said that they shall wax worse and worse. That means it will increase in the amount of false teachers. And it also used the words deceiving, which means that they will roam from the truth. See, false teachers appear as the ministers of Christ. But we've got to learn what those false marks are. And those are in your handout. There are six of them. We're going to go through those. We gave you the seventh one last week. There are some blanks filled in. You don't have to fill in anything up to this point. Just listen, and I'll tell you when the first blank comes, okay? But for just now, let me give you just a little bit of review because the series has been so long. It's easy to lose focus or direction of a series uh, when you've been in one this long, and I don't want to do that. But we learned the first mark. In your handout, look at it. The first mark of a false teacher is that they reject the sufficiency of Christ. What? That's right. They reject that. Christ work what? Christ's work on the cross. See, Christ gave himself as a ransom for all. He paid sin's price for the entire world. He made it possible for everyone to be reconciled and redeemed back to God. See, Christ's work on the cross, the cross of Calvary, is sufficient for mankind's sinful need. It is is enough. It's not the cross plus something. It's not grace plus something else. It is faith alone in the cross work of Jesus Christ. False teachers deny that though. They deny it. They refuse to appropriate God's gift of righteousness by faith. See, false teachers, they deny the sufficiency of Christ's work by mingling faith 
and human works. And when you take faith and you add good works to it, it is a denial of Christ's sufficiency, and it's a trampling of God's grace. So that's the first mark of a false teacher. The second mark of a false teacher is that they do not accept God's word as the what? Final and ultimate authority. Folks, I want you to know that I'm not old-fashioned. I'm not uh, uh, some uh, person who is so narrowed mind, not narrow-minded that I uh, that I'm not willing to learn other things. But I am saying to you tonight publicly that I believe this book holds all the answers that I need. Did you hear me? I believe it holds all the answers that I need. So you mean like where you're going to shop for Christmas? Come on, Pastor Larry. You mean the Bible's going to tell you where to shop? No, it won't tell me where to shop. But I'll tell you what it'll tell me. It'll tell me how much I spend on myself as opposed I give to God. It'll definitely make sure that my life is not lived for shopping, that my life is lived unto Christ. And so, yes, I do believe that this book, is the final and ultimate authority for all mankind. See, I believe that the Bible is God's final and complete word of truth. John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them uh, through thy word. Thy word is truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. There is no doubt about it. God's word is the truth. And that is what sanctifies. That is what separates and that is what absolutely grows believers into the image of Christ. And it's through the word of God. See, God is not dispensing any new revelation. We cannot add to God's law. We cannot add to prophecy. We cannot add to church age doctrine. And it's so important for us to make sure that we're rooted and grounded in God's word. The third mark of a false teacher is that they may attract big crowds and have many followers. You know what I have found? People are more apt to believe a lie than they are to believe the truth. But I'm also reminded, if you look at 2 Peter chapter 2, would you look at verse 3? The Bible says, And through covetousness shall they... Who are they? Well, if you'd go all the way back to verse 2, here's the day. They... But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false, what's that next word? Teachers. Are you with me, church? Verse 1. So in verse 3, and through covetousness shall they, you got to answer the they, we've already answered the they over many weeks. Notice this phrase in verse 3, with feigned words make merchandise of you. We have learned that feigned words means plastic. It means their words are pliable and able to be twisted. We also understand that the crowd can be wrong. The Bible says in Exodus 23, 2, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil, neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. Proverbs eleven twenty one says, Though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished, but the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. I want you to know that it's very important that we understand that their words are very pliable, that they will absolutely twist God's word to make it say what they want it to say because they do it with feigned words. But that brings me to the fourth mark of a false teacher, which came, which came from verse 3. Fourth mark of a false teacher is that they are full of greed. He said that with vain words, they'll make merchandise of you. That word make merchandise means to exploit. You like to be exploited? You like to be taken advantage of? Do you like to be manipulated? Do you like to be hoodooed? Do you like to be uh, 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 just uh, uh, kind of hook, line, and sinker? Do you like to be kind of uh, uh, just absolutely um, duped into something? Absolutely not. But the Bible says that false teachers are very good at this. And that's what Paul and Peter, I should say, is saying here.
to us. See, false teachers, they prey on people who do not know their Bible. That's why it's crucial for us to get rooted and grounded in the truth of God's Word. Number five, fifth mark of a false teacher is that they deny the doctrine of hell and judgment. We spent uh, an entire week on that, and I encourage you to go online uh, and listen to that. But we've learned that hell is a place of God's wrath. It's a place of torment and fire. Hell is a place of rebellion. Hell is a place that is eternal. Hell is a place of weariness. But the question is, why was hell created then? If it's so bad and no one wants to go there, then why was it created? Well, the truth is, out of Matthew 25, 41, the Bible tells us, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. The truth is, God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. And I told you before, and it was many weeks ago, there are three votes, three deciding votes, to where a person will spend eternity. If you're watching by internet, listening, really listen to this point. My friend, you have three votes to decide where you will spend eternity. See, God gets a vote. Satan gets a vote. God is for you. Satan is against you. But there is a third vote that decides where you will spend eternity. My friend, it is your vote. What will you choose to do with what Christ has done for you on the cross of Calvary? Will you choose to cast your ballot with Satan? Then, my friend, you will go and spend eternity in a place called hell. It's a Christless hell. As I just read to you out of Matthew 25, 41, that it was prepared for Satan and his angels. You can vote that way, or you can vote and cast your vote and put your faith and promise in the cross work of Jesus Christ. My friend, that is three votes. See, God in his love sent Jesus as our substitute to pay for our price of sin. The sixth mark of a false teacher is that they have an unsubmissive attitude towards authority. They rebel against the authority of Jesus Christ. They rebel against the authority of God's Word. They rebel against the authority of the local church. They rebel against the local government. And that brings me to the seventh mark. You should already have this one filled in. The seventh mark of a false teacher is that they are outwardly religious, but inwardly, say it with me, empty. What are they? Empty. Look at verse 17 and 18 of chapter 2. The Bible says, These are wells without water. We're going to learn what that is tonight. Clouds that are carried with the tempest, to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. We're going to study that out. But in your handout, you should have this filled in. See, false teachers put a lot of emphasis on outward religious acts, thinking that these things gain them acceptance before God. I told you last week that many cults and false religions do this. They absolutely indoctrinate people into their practices and into their religious duties because if you do what we do, and if you do what we tell you to do, then God will be pleased. Do you know that separates us from every other belief system? Uh, I don't believe that uh, God is looking for something that you have to do. I think that you have to rest in what's already been done. And that is the cross work of Jesus Christ has settled the issue. All that you and I need to do is rest in Jesus Christ and allow Him to live in us, that He'll live through us. And that is the Christ life. But false religions uh, don't do that. They attempt to make a person good enough to obtain heaven. They, they, they do it through good deeds. They, they have to do it through their own religious acts. And in your handout, this is a blank that you 
have to fill in? Or is it already filled in? Is it filled in, Melissa? Letter B? Well, look at it with me anyway, all right? True Christian faith begins inwardly and works its way outward, creating marvelous change. How many of you know that your good works are as filthy rags? How many of you know that? You know what the Bible says? That there is none righteous, no, not one. There are none that doeth good, the Bible says. Do you know that all of your good works, all of your confirmation, all of your church attendance, all of your teaching, all of whatever service that you could do, do you know that that won't get you into heaven? Isn't that something? You'd think that there'd be some way, and so people are convinced because of their jobs or whatever, because we get self-acclimation and, and uh, we get confidence and from our, our work because we earn a wage and so we earn a paycheck. And so, therefore, we, uh, we kind of ascertain that to Jesus Christ. But the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And so what you and I have earned, even our best effort, is spiritual death. But when you are saved, we understand that through the teaching of God's Word, there is an inward working. And that is what makes an outward change. It comes from inside. The Bible says that this is a new birth. You're in 2 Peter chapter 2, right? I want you to go to 2 Corinthians 5.17 with me. Let's look at this verse together. 2 Corinthians 5.17. I'd like for us to dissect this verse just for a moment. I want to hone in on something that is so crucial for the believer. See, when a person is saved, there is a new birth. This takes place on the inside. God's Spirit, the Bible says, at the moment that someone trusts Christ as their Savior, the Bible says that they are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, that 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 moment Christ comes and dwells inside of them. Then that life, the Christ life, can be manifested in and through us as we yield to Christ in us. This can never, though, be accomplished through good works or good deeds. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.17. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore... Based on the teaching beforehand, based on what I've just went over, if any man be, notice these two words, say them with me, in Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So I just looked in the mirror before I came here, preacher, and it looks like the same old me. I know outwardly it is the same old you. And that carcass is decaying. Right? It ain't getting better. How many of your bodies is getting better? How many of you growing younger? Nobody. God never intended for that temple to last. You know that, that temple has an expiration date. God never meant for it to last forever. Sometimes we live like we're going to live forever here. Isn't that what the Jehovah's Witnesses are trying to do? Aren't they trying to live here forever? They can have this place. They can have this. Man, I'm going to glory. And contrary to popular belief, it's not filled up. They think it is, but it's not. There's room for you. There's room at the cross for you. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Man, I'm so thankful that there is enough room for you. I'm so thankful the cross isn't done. I'm so thankful that there is grace to be extended. But notice in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he uses that marvelous phrase, we stopped, we said it together, in Christ. Did you notice it did not say, therefore, 
If any man do this or do that. Did you notice that? It didn't say, well, if any man can accomplish this. If any man can do this. If any man can say this. If any man can perform this. That is not what it says. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ. Are you in Christ? Is, are you taking up residence in your Savior? And is He in you? That means your position is in Jesus. Are you presently in Christ? Then if you are in that, that is a work that happens from the inside out. That's the way it works, folks. That's the way it works. How many of you love mozzarella sticks? Raise your hand. You know what mozzarella sticks are? It's this fattest piece of cheese you ever had. And then they got this wonderful idea to deep fry it in batter. In hot grease. Amen. They batter it and deep fry it. Yep. It's cholesterol on a stick. That's what it is. You know, um, when we were dating, one of our favorite things to do... Um, we didn't have any money, and we still don't because we have children. Thank you. And, um, but uh, we, uh, we love mozzarella sticks, don't we, Abigail? It's one of our favorite things. Well, uh, our, our kids wanted to see where we grew up and where we used to go when we dated and where we used to live before we had kids and uh, where mom and daddy used to work. And, and, uh, and so they love looking at all that and we love showing them all that. We love for them to be a part of our life and learn and uh, experience part of that. Well, one of the favorite things that we used to do is we would, we would leave. We would drive all the way over town. We, didn't have, we couldn't go out to eat, but we could go by Libby Hill, and we could buy mozzarella sticks, and they'd give you ranch dressing. And uh, dipping those mozzarella sticks in ranch dressing, that was just so good. And, uh, but there was one time... And uh, that we went and we got some mozzarella sticks and I bit into one of those mozzarella sticks and, and I, it, I bit into that and I was just like, this, something's wrong. This is weird. And it was a mozzarella stick without any mozzarella. It was a hollow shell of batter. It was perfect. You would not have known that there was no cheese in it. Do you know that many Christians or many people live their life just like that outwardly? They look good. Outwardly, they look perfect to the church. Man, to the deacon at the church or to the preacher, they got them full. Man, they can sit up straight. They can quote a verse. Man, they bring that Bible. They can sing a note. But Inwardly, they are empty. And many people live their life that way. And I don't care how you dress it up. I don't care how short you cut your hair. How many dresses you put on. How many ties you choke your neck around. It doesn't matter. What matters is what's on the inside. And that's what false teachers focus on. They focus on the outward. But Christ works on the inward. And my friend, you get the inward right, there will be an outward change. Won't be a mozzarella stick, all right? So let's not have any mozzarella stick Christians. Amen? But Paul, or Peter, I should say, does give us a few illustrations here. And I want to give them to you very quickly out of Second Peter. He kind of lists them here. So if you go back to 2 Peter, he kind of gives you a list of uh, 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 a few illustrations of those that, uh, man, outwardly, they look really good. And uh, so if you look at 2 Peter chapter 2, and look at verse 17. Kind of a strange couple of verses. And uh, we're going to break this down, look at this together. Notice verse 17, these are wells without water. Clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the midst of darkness is, is reserved forever. In your handout, this is the first blank that I want you to fill in. 
He says these, talking about false teachers, are wells. That's a fountain or a spring. He says without, write this in, water. He says these are wells without water. These, of course, are referring to false teachers. And a well is a fountain or it is a spring. Can you imagine being very thirsty? And going to a well or going to your refrigerator or going to a creek or going to uh, a, a, a fresh spring that you uh, knew was once working and you go there to get something to refresh your mouth with and to just quench that thirst that you have and it is empty. And Peter is drawing an analogy here. And that is in your handout, Jesus is the only one who can give inner peace, satisfaction, and quench our spiritual thirst. Jesus is the only one who can give inner peace. Would you go to the Gospel of John with me? John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John chapter 4. And look at verses 13 and 14. Look at this with me. John chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Are you there? Say amen. Jesus said unto... Jesus answered and said unto her, obviously, this is the woman at Jacob's well. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinks of this water shall thirst again. Well, that's a problem. She didn't expect to hear that. But then notice what Jesus says. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water I shall give him shall be, notice this, where? Huh? Do you see it? A well of water springing up into everlasting life. Hey, what's in you should come out of you. People are good fakers. People are good for making it look well and, and making good appearances. But Jesus said, the water that I give you huh, isn't just an outward adorning. It doesn't come from the outside in. It comes from the inside out. Jesus says, if you take of my water, if you drink what I give, that comes from in you. So different from what false teachers teach. See, false teachers offer substitutes. You know, if you give so much money, if you knock on so many doors, if you serve in so many capacities, if, if some other religions just have their own material books that they even put on the same level or authority as God's Word, the Holy Bible. Many false teachers and religions do that. The Jehovah's Witness do that. The, the, the Book of the Mormon, they, they believe that, that only their, their, the Bible, our Bible, the Holy Word of God, is able to be understood as it is read with the Book of Mormon. May I tell you that is heresy? May I tell you that is false religion? It's wrong. God's Word is the final and ultimate authority. And it's so important that we understand that, and we've been learning this, and I want you to get this in your handout, the Pharisees were outwardly religious, but inwardly empty. They were outwardly religious. We've been studying that, but inwardly empty. We've been studying that on Sunday mornings. We've been in this series on how not to be a religious Pharisee. And it goes right along with our study tonight. It's so important that we understand that 
that in Matthew 23, there, there are so many times that Jesus says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. Woe unto you, ye hypocrites. Over and over, Jesus gave warnings. Why? Because these religious people, oh, well, outwardly, they looked good. But inwardly, they were empty. So, back to 2 Peter chapter 2. Peter gives the reference that uh, these are wells without water. But notice the rest of the verse, the next part. He said, they are clouds that are carried with a tempest. So in your handout, would you write that in? They are like clouds that are carried with a tempest. Wells without water, clouds without a tempest. What in the world does that mean? They're like clouds that are floating around, big, fluffy. They're visible, but they bring no rain. Again, you hear, here you see the illustration of something that outwardly looks full, but inwardly, it's empty. Here come some clouds. Maybe we're going to get some rain. Nope. Those clouds just went by. Oh, we're desperate for rain. Maybe there'll be some rain in those clouds. Nope. Outwardly, they look very good. But inwardly, again, they're empty. Do you know the word tempest here in this verse means a whirlwind? In other words, you may see a lot of movement. False teachers may and false religions may bring a lot of motion. They may bring a lot of entertainment. They may bring a big movement. But those that are empty will be easily carried away. And that's why Peter is saying false teachers are like wells without water. They're like clouds that are carried away with the next movement. They're not rooted and grounded in God's word. Would you notice the next part of verse 17? It says, To whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. So in your handout, number three, would you write in, the midst of darkness is reserved forever for these false teachers. Just go ahead and keep writing if you would. False teachers profess to be the only carriers of the true light. But in reality, they are leading people to the very depths of blackness, gloom, and darkness. They are the ones that believe they are the only ones who have the truth. I remember while I was in Daytona, uh, we were, I don't know if it was an outreach event or if we were visiting for our bus ministry. I can't remember this now, but I had some singles with me. Some singles were visiting with me. I may have shared this with you. And um, we went up to this house, and it's kind of up a hill, and we got there, and um, there was three or four with us, and so uh, we didn't want to um, bombard the place. And so just a couple of us went up to the door while the other two kind of stood back, and we knocked on the door, and uh, we were uh, just out knocking on doors, inviting people to church, and, and uh, seeing if we could get... Uh, uh, people to attend our church and a lady answered the door and she only answered it about this much she only opened it about this much and so she opened it and I, I went hi and she went like this I said I'm Pastor Larry and we're just visiting from our church and, and uh, I have so and so with me and uh, we'd like to invite people to church and, and she opened up her door even more and she said oh, I have a church and we said, okay, well, that, that, that's wonderful, and, uh, but do you go faithfully, and do you, do you attend? And, and uh, I, I could already tell that she was not willing to have the conversation. And um, she says, well, I don't feel well. And I said, well, okay. I said, um, 
I said, well, why don't you feel well? What happened? And uh, are you sick or well, what's going on? She goes, well, I just came out of surgery. And we said, well, what kind of surgery? And she said, I, I just came out of surgery, I, I, I cancer. And we said, well, ma'am, um, we'd like to pray with you. And she said, absolutely not. And, and I, we looked at her and we said, well, ma'am, just because you don't come to our church doesn't mean we can't pray for you. But she said, no, I, I, I don't want you to pray for me. And then she shut the door, slammed the door. My point in telling you that was, there are some individuals who believe that they are the only ones that have the truth. And if I was to mention this person's denomination, you would, you would, you would quickly, quickly identify with it, and, and uh, you, you'd be like I was. I don't understand why she didn't want us to pray for her. didn't make sense to me. But you know that, that the Baptist faith is not the only ones who have the truth of God's Word. Not trying to upset your apple cart tonight. You know that there are churches that don't even have Baptist on their marquee, but they preach God's word. There are churches out there called Grace Baptist. There are churches out there called Bible Baptist. There are churches out there uh, uh, called uh, uh, Bible Community, and 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 we've gone to churches because we go to church when we're on vacation, and and we we attend a lot of churches, and we purposely attend churches that aren't just like ours. We want to see what's different, and, and we want to learn something new, and, and we want to see what, uh, what other churches are doing. And I want you to know that, that there are other churches that don't have Baptists anywhere. They're not associated with any Bap Baptist uh, denomination, independent or fundamental or anything. They're not associated with anything, and yet they're preaching God's Word. And so I'm saying to you, though, false teachers believe that they're the only ones that have the true light. But in reality, they are the ones who are leading people to the very depths of darkness, as it is in this verse. It says, whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. And folks, I want you to know that, yes, we believe that we have the truth of God's Word. But it's important to make sure that that's what we preach and teach, and that we lift high the Word of God. And that we stick true to the Word of God. And we, that we don't compromise it in any way. And that we don't become uh, these people. But that we hold true to God's Word. And that we understand. And that we're able to identify what false teachers look like. So, the question is in your handout. How do false teachers attract people to follow them? Okay, we've spent so many weeks on this. How, how do they get people to follow them? How do they get people to follow them? After all, verse 2 says of chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, it says, And many shall follow their pernicious ways. How do they get many to follow? I mean, if it's so clear in the Scriptures what they look like and where they come from and what the marks of them are, how do they get so many people to follow them? Verse 18 tells you. Verse 18. Notice. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. What in the world does that mean? Here it means. Here's what it means in your handout. They are eloquent promoters of their doctrine. They are eloquent promoters of their doctrine. Say, what do you mean by that? Did you notice the phrase, great swelling words? Look at verse 18. For when they speak, great swelling words of vanity. You know that that means that their words are inflated and that they mean nothing? You ever heard someone say, 
That person is just a lot of hot air. Do you know that that's exactly what this phrase means? They say a lot, but it means nothing. They have a lot to say, but it means nothing. So I want you to be careful. We've got to be careful of being impressed with those who are of eloquent speech. Just because they have good words and they have fair speech, it may just be religious oratory. In other words, Peter said, their words have no meaning. A lot is being said, but it absolutely means nothing. Do you know Paul knew the difference between communication and manipulation? And I believe that we should preach to express the truth rather than trying to impress people with the truth. We should be preaching the truth to impact people's lives and change them and not preach the Word of God to impress them. Did you hear me, church? Did you hear me? Church is not to impress you. It's to impact you. There are a lot of churches, there are a dime a dozen that will impress you. People come to our church all the time impressed with the building. May I tell you that the mortgage at 10,005, 10,050, that's not real impressionable. But it's really impacting. Real impressed with that. God's not impressed with that. I'm not impressed with that. Nor should anyone come. Yes, we decorate. Yes, we do our best. I think we ought to do our best heartily as unto the Lord. But I'm going to tell you something. If that's our own intent, may I tell you that's what false teachers are good at. Good at impressing. Look at us. Look how we're doing. That's what false teachers do. It's important that we're absolutely getting the right message out, and that is the truth. So, how do they do it? They're eloquent promoters of their own teaching. But number two in your handout, they appeal to the fleshly nature. That's in verse 18. But then, would you write this in, in verse uh, on, in number three? It comes from verse 18 as well. They prey on people who have recently clean escaped. Would you write that word in? Escaped from their old ways. That's a unique phrase. One that we don't go around and say a lot. One maybe you haven't read a lot. But the truth is, there's a great cross-reference And it comes from verse 14 of the same chapter. Having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and heart, they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. May I tell you right now that the false teachers have no message for the down and out sinner? You ask a Jehovah's Witness, how can I be saved? How can my sins be forgiven? How can, I, how can I earn eternal life? What did Jesus do for me? And you listen to what they'll tell you. They have no message for the down and out sinner. False teachers make their living off of church people. They make their living off of baby Christians, immature Christians, those who are not rooted and built up in Christ. Remember Colossians 2, 7, rooted and built up in Him. False teachers prey on those who do not know their Bible. I'm going to tell you something, church. Tonight, we cannot blame new Christians for falling prey to these false teachers. It's not new believers' fault. We have to teach them God's Word and get them grounded in God's Word. Do you know it's the church's responsibility? we got to get people in the Bible. Do you hear me tonight? That's why it's important that people come to church. That's why it's important for us to get people in God's Word so they don't become prey to false teachers. 
We don't do it just so we can have a big gathering. We don't do it just so we can hang out. We don't do it just so we can uh, figure out what, what happened this week with you and how and all that. We come together so we can fellowship in the Word. And yes, we'll fellowship before and afterwards, but the main reason that we come together is because I want to make sure that I don't become prey to these false teachers who absolutely manipulate God's Word for their own self-benefit. Church, let's make sure that we're in the Word. Let's make sure that we're rooted and built up in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for your Word. God, I just pray that we will be faithful to it. And God, that we will always seize the opportunity to be in your Word. And Lord, every time we're at church, it's just another opportunity to be together with other believers and to be in the precious Word of God. Thank you for this series. Thank you for allowing us to see and be able to mark what false teachers are. God, thank you for allowing us to see uh, where they are, who they are, and, and what their marks are, Lord, to be able to know and to grow and to be able to, to understand your Word and so we do not become prey to false teaching. And God, I know it doesn't win a popularity contest. But God, it sure does keep us built up in you. Help us, it helps us to grow in the Word of God. And so, Father, we just pray that we'll be mindful of others. God, that we will give others the truth, that we invite others to, the, to church, that they may hear the truth, because it is the truth that sets men free. And Lord, whom you set free shall be free indeed. Father, we love you and thank you for our study tonight. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.